Hey, everyone. Today, I'm going to be talking about decompiling Solana programs. Um, so funny story before we start, actually. Uh, I, I thought this talk was going to be 30 minutes long, and it's actually 15. So uh, we might need to cut some of the later slides a bit short. Um, but yeah, here's a quick overview. Um, I'm going to be talking about some tooling we wrote for decompiling Solana programs. Um, and actually, one really interesting question that we, we come across sometimes when, when we write this tooling is, is what is the use case? Um, and uh, luckily, there was, or maybe unluckily, uh, there was a recent hack on Solana um, called Loopscale. And we, we worked with that team on the hack. Um, and, and they were actually a really good support here. And, and they let us uh, include them in this presentation. Um, and we used our decompilation framework to, to look at that hack and figure out what happened. Um, so part of this presentation will be talking through how we can use um, our, our decompilation framework in, in a real world example. Um, but first off, for some context, uh, if, if, if you're building on Solana, uh, you probably know this. Um, unfortunately, most programs on Solana are, are closed source. Um, this is a graph by uh, Jonas from the Solana Foundation. Um, so this isn't exactly the number of closed source programs. This is the amount of programs, or this is the amount of compute on Solana, which is verified. Um, and if you look here, the, uh, the orange, which is 96.9%, is not verified. Uh, so so the, the vast majority of, of programs that users interact with, at least weighted by compute, are closed sourced in some way, um, which raises a really difficult question for users. Uh, how, how can you know what you're actually interacting with? So, loop scale, um, I think this was, I mean, time flies, but this is around one to two weeks ago. Um, loop scale got hacked for, I think, around $5 million. Um, we worked with them. Thankfully, all the funds were covered. Um, you know, they did a really good job, and, and they were also really nice to let us, let us share this example. Um, but a really interesting part of this hack is that the attacker deployed a program as part of that hack. And they deployed a program which, in effect, was spoofing an oracle on, on the loop scale lending market. Um, and I think the natural question here is, how do we know? Or how can we understand what this program is actually doing? Um, and this is also a question just in general. You know, if, if you're trying to figure out what a program does on Solana, how would you approach it? And how would you analyze it? So for those of you who don't know, uh, all Solana programs, uh, you can just run this command to dump it from the Solana CLI. They are all ELF files um, written in BPF, um, but they're actually pretty close to classic reverse engineering targets. Um, so you know, if you're a normal re reverse engineer, you might deal with x86 or ARM binaries. Uh, the only somewhat complex part, or not only, but the, the main complexity here is that it's in a different uh, architecture. So not very commonly supported. Uh, you, know, you can hex dump it, which is not super useful. But actually, you can, you can disassemble it with, with normal tool chains. Um, so uh, you can use LVM um, object dump, and you can disassemble it. And you can actually see the disassembly. So, th so this is the disassembly of, of the, of the um, attacker program. Uh, fun fact, uh, their entry point was misnamed. So that's why it's spelled my entry pot instead of my entry point. Um, but you know, this, this assembly is, is not super readable. And uh, you know, it's, it's pretty hard to understand what's going on. Um, so the question is, how do we get a bit closer to something that is human readable? Um, you know, maybe something that is in C and Rust. This is what we built, um, I mean, back in 2022. But we've been maintaining it ever since. Essentially, we wrote a plugin that, that turns Solana BPF bytecode into something human readable using existing reverse engineering tooling. And we actually have a blog post about this. So I won't go super in depth into how this workflow works. Um, but we use an existing uh, reverse engineering framework called Binary Ninja. Um, and the way it works is it maps everything to a common um, IL, uh, or intermediate language. So uh, you can see here you have x86. You have a plugin that turns it into an IL. Uh, you have ARM, turns it into, they call it low-level IL or LLIL. And then you also have BPF, which we use, which we wrote a custom plugin for to turn it into an IL that Binary Ninja operates on. Here's some example. So you have assembly, and then you have the IL. So you can see it looks more or less the same. You have like move R2, R1, which trans translates into R2 equals R1. Uh, you have call, et cetera. Pretty straightforward. So yeah, I, I mentioned before that uh, BPF, you know, the, the fact that it was written in a different architecture is one of the complexities. Uh, there's actually some more as well. Um, one complexity is, is re resolving syscalls. 
So you see here, this is an example of a syscall that calls on some buffer, um, also mapping memory. This is, uh, I guess it's not super clear from this snippet what, what exactly it is, but uh, you know, we, we, we have to figure out how the SVM deals with memory mapping in order to understand what exactly these functions are doing. Um, first off, let's talk about memory. Um, so uh, you guys probably know this, but uh, there's four main memory regions in, in, in the Solana virtual machine program code, stack data, heap data, and in the input region. Um, and everything needs to be shifted uh, to properly account for uh, the program region. Next, we need to map the syscalls. I'm not going to go super in depth here. Um, and basically, the end result, after, after you do all those details that aren't super relevant, um, is you actually get a pretty readable snippet of, of pseudo C. So this is actually the decompilation of the attacker program. So first off, uh, we have a function that takes in the first argument. This is responsible for reading the, uh, the accounts and instruction data out, out of the first argument. Um, but basically, what you need to know is that this is uh, shared across all programs. Um, the second part is actually what the attacker is doing. And there's only three lines here, which is pretty interesting. Um, so the first line does nothing. It just assigns some variable. The second line logs a bunch of ones. Um, and the third line calls a function which sets the return value to a hard-coded number. So from this, we're able to you know, pretty accurately deduce that all this attacker program is doing is it's setting a hard-coded return value. And this might be confusing at first, but if, if you recall what, you know, how this program was being used in the context of the hack, it was being used as uh, a spoofed Oracle program. So you know, it's, it's hard-coding the return value uh, to spoof the you know, essentially, it's, it's passing in a program that, that returns a very high price. And the last part, this is just uh, checking um, some account locks. This is also shared across all Solana programs. Um, but overall, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty surprising as well that you know, we can take this attacker program and, and turn it into something that, or at least I think it's surprising, that we can take it into something that's, that's human readable. And, and we can know with confidence that the only thing it's doing is setting a return value. It's not like messing with any account data. It's not doing anything crazy. Um, it's just setting a single hard-coded um, return data value. Uh, but unfortunately, most programs aren't very simple. Uh, so uh, this program probably was either written in C or was like one line of Rust code. Um, most modern programs are a lot more complicated. Um, just as an example, this is, uh, I think, something from Camino. So you have a single log instruction, and it translates into like 30 lines of uh, pseudo C. So uh, how can we deal with this problem? One observation is a lot of the structures uh, that are used are, are reused, right? So for example, a lot of people import uh, the pub key from, from the Solana SDK. A lot of people import um, the instruction struct from the Solana SDK. And, and if we have some intuition about what those look like, we can provide a, a more readable output for them. Um, in Anchor as well, um, a lot of stuff can be inferred from logs and, and IDLs. And I, I think uh, Sec3 actually is, is either gave a talk already or is giving a talk about this soon. They, they wrote a really cool thing where they parse out, um, they infer the IDL instructions. Um, but the intuition here is that um, the, the IDL actually tells you quite a lot, right? It tells you sort of what the instruction is trying to do. Um, it tells you uh, what arguments you pass to it. And, and with that, you can get a rough sense of what the, what the, um, what the handler is supposed to be doing. Um, so there's, there's a lot of things that you uh, can't find. Um, one example is structs. Uh, structs don't persist in the binary. Um, when you compile down to, to, uh, to assembly, um, the only thing that you can see are, are, are the pointer offsets. Um, you know, variable types don't exist. Um, and also, probably the, the, most, uh, the hardest one is, is symbol names disappear. Um, and intuitively, this is because when you compile down, you don't need to have symbol names. Uh, or the program doesn't need symbol names to execute. So those are all dropped, uh, which is why you get left with something that's pretty hard to read. Um, the question is, can we get some of this back? Uh, yeah, we can, with, with the help of our, our great friend Claude. And you know, we are pretty skeptical of AI. Um, and I know this, this might sound like a stretch, but you know, if, if you guys are, are skeptical, let me sell you a little bit on, on why Claude might be a, a reasonable solution here. Um, yeah, so our, our end goal is going back to the Rust source. Um, you know, the, the pseudo C code is not super readable, but it's super correct. Um, 
the thing is, we don't actually really care about correctness when we're, when we're reverse engineering programs. And you know, this is not the case for most things in security. But when we're reverse engineering a program, you know, we kind of just want a high-level intuition of what the program does. Um, even when you're a human reverse engineering stuff, you don't have, you know, you don't know for sure, for example, what the variable names are or what the struct types are. You just get a good enough intuition, and then you can kind of fill in the gaps. Um, so in this sense, it actually doesn't matter if Claude is making stuff up, uh, because that's sort of what we do as a human anyways. Um, so what if we just let the model guess? Uh, so we use this really nice feature, um, uh, which is really popular on Twitter, uh, model context protocol. Um, but basically, like you don't need to really know what this does. Uh, I mean, we just expose um, the, the decompilation output to Claude, and we let it tell us what it thinks it does. And actually, it's, it's super good at this. Um, Surprisingly good. Um, yeah, so we, we, here are some specific actions we give it. Um, you know, we let it define structs. We let it rename variables. Um, we let it enter the edit the function signature. Um, so see here, it can uh, deduce that um, the entry point takes the, the sole parameters uh, or pointer to sole parameters. Um, yeah. So uh, this is the attacking program. If we if we just ask Claude nicely and we say, can you make this Rust? Um, and it actually looks pretty readable, right? And you can recall it looks pretty similar to what happened before. You, you have the log message where it logs a bunch of ones. Um, it's a hard-coded return value, um, and it sets the return data um, with that hard-coded return value, which, which actually is exactly correct. Um, and then the last part is cleaning up account references, um, which, again, is, is, is roughly correct. Um, so yeah, it's, you know, we were pretty skeptical when we saw this, but it's, it's actually really amazing how, how well it works. Um, uh, OK, I have a minute left, so I'm going to speed through this part. Um, but essentially, the, the intuition here is we can provide additional context. right? So we can extract IDLs. Um, this gives us signatures and structs. And actually, this is really useful for Claude, because if we give it the variable names, Claude sorts of makes up something from it. Um, and it can, it can deduce with relatively high accuracy what things are doing. Um, so we tried it on Camino Lending. Um, you know, Camino is open source, of course. Um, but uh, this is the original decompilation. You can see it's uh, pretty unclear what it's doing. And uh, this is improved. And this is the final Rust view, um, uh, once, we give it the, um, once we give the IDL data. Right? So yeah, uh, we tell it that the, the function name is init farms for reserve. Um, you know, it parses to the IDL the different reserve types. And then you can see it just as a CPI into the, into the farm uh, yeah, it, it does a CPI uh, into some handler. Um, and, and Claude did all of this. Uh, and, you know, we, we cherry picked this example a little bit, but I, I still think it's really cool, right? It shows that with the IDL and, and this other information, we can get pretty far with, um, with, with how the decompilation looks. Um, and this is the original source uh, for reference. Everything's open source. Uh, you know, feel free to find me uh, around or, or leave some comments on, on GitHub. You know, we try to maintain everything. Um, We'll, we'll try to answer your questions. Um, but yeah, we're, we're really excited to, to share this with the community. And hopefully, if, if there's some closed source program that you see that you don't know what it's doing, you can give this a try and see if it, see if it helps you understand what's going on. Uh, yeah, future developments. Um, thanks for your time. <laughs>